Thank you for joining us tonight for our featured reading with virtual visiting writer, Joy Priest. Joy Priest is the author of Horse Power from Pit, the Pitt Poetry Series in 2020, and it was the winner of the Donald Hall Prize for Poetry. Her work has been recognized for a 2021 NEA Fellowship, a 2019-2020 Fine Arts Work Center Fellowship, and the Stanley Kunitz Memorial Prize, among other awards, and has appeared in numerous publications, including Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, American Poetry Review, and The Atlantic. She received her MFA in poetry and, um, with a certificate of women and gender studies from the University of South Carolina, and is currently a doctoral student in literature and creative writing at the University of Houston. Tonight, Joy will read, and then we will have a short question and answer to follow. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and thank you all for turning your videos on. I was like, oh no, just <laughs> I, I like the um, reading it to feel like a reading room um, since we don't get to go to bookstores and things um, these days. But uh, yeah, so tomorrow, so tomorrow, I'm really excited about this craft talk. I've never given a craft talk before. Um, I like kind of stumbled into a topic I'm really into. Um, and so tonight I'm gonna read some poems from Horsepower. I'm gonna read all the horse poems that I can fit into the time from Horsepower. Um, so I can, so, you know, the, the kind of ways that the horse functions in the collection can just be in the air um, as it connects to tomorrow's talk. Tomorrow's, you know, I was thinking about how black poets, well, actually, uh, you know, poets of color write about the animal. Um, like two books that were with me a lot when I was writing Horsepower was um, Horse in the Dark by Vivi Francis and Beast Meridian by Vanessa Angelica Villarreal. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I think about, I was, I've was i been thinking about that a lot over the last few years because um, traditionally um, black and brown people uh, in the colony have, have been conflated with animals in, in, in degrading ways. And so I was always curious about why we, um, why we, why we, why we have this obsession with, uh, particularly like the equus, um, the, um, and other four-legged beasts. And, um, and so, you know, I've been reading a lot of Sylvia Winter, Josh Bennett, who's a poet, writes about this a lot. And, um, and so I wanted to get into it. So, uh, that's pretty much where I'll be going tomorrow, but also there will be a craft as aspect uh, um, about my approach to the line. I um I also put together this like uh, twenty poem packet that if you if you do sign up for the craft talk, you'll get. I think Sarah is sending out um, sending it out with the link. Um, and you know, I got everybody from like Paul Lawrence Dunbar to Taylor Johnson. I S Jones uh, poem is in there. Um, and so I'll be looking at a couple of poems, uh, and this will be specifically about the deer, the deer as it shows up in, um, the work of Black poets. Um, I have a deer poem in here, I believe, which I didn't realize, kind of, uh, <laughs> so I'll start with that one, um, and then I'll read the horse poems, and then I was thinking of reading from my long essay, about Louisville and hip hop and cars. Um, Cause I, I feel like I, I'm, I don't know, like I've been reading from Horsepower and, it's, and all these things are virtual. So I feel like people have heard the book several times and <laughs> you know, I gotta keep it spicy. Um, when I was in uh, doing my MFA, my teacher, Nikki Finney, she's like, she has like a whole library of, <laughs> I'm not gonna DJ tonight though, sorry, Glenna. <laughs> She has a whole library of uh, reference books that she just like kind of has collected as a writer. And um, one of the ones that, and she, she sort of brought some in and had us pick, pick one out um, to do a project on. And the one I picked was Exaltation of Larks by James Lipton. And it's this book about collective nouns. Um, and it also though details, you know, the origins of collective nouns, how they came about about as a hunting game in medieval Europe. And um, etymologically, I, I sort of realized that hunting 
and love had the same root word in, in the English language um, and how that sort of informed and shaped our, our uh, romantic relationships and so forth. Upon reading James Lipton's An Exaltation of Larks, the etymological origins of both love and hunt crouch hidden in the same word, venery. A bevy of beauties can refer to deer or quell on the ground or young ladies. When he says to me, I like a woman who plays hard to get, he is talking about an old game for huntsmen camouflaged in the language so that where two women are gathered, they might be called a whisper. When he says a woman who makes me work for it, he's talking about his desire fixed on the chase, a fawn caught in the clearing of his iris, desire at its origin so close to kill, a loot of little deaths. Bob-tailed feather, medieval arrow-headed footed, aluminum guinea wig, target quivered bone sheath, barkins dagger, metal spiked flint breasted obsidian, broadhead, white cloth clout for a future bow. When he says, well, you can't rape the willing, he means no fun, no sport, no game. A lioness presents her apricot belly, her head sized paw folded limp around the rifle, a pride of pussy. How grotesque. If a woman is to be worn down one mounted as trophy, then he can never be sure of her no. An illness of enamoradas, a hand hushed over Cupid's bow. <laughs> okay, so um, can y'all hear me okay? All right. The computer's kind of far, so, okay. If, you, if you're not familiar with the book, uh, Horsepower, um, you know, encapsulates a lot of things. I, I didn't have the title until I wrote this poem, the title poem. And I think most of the themes are sort of, uh, they occur throughout this poem. Uh, but, you know, largely I grew up across the street from Churchill Downs, which is where they run the Kentucky Derby every year. And I grew up on the stable side of the racetrack where the horses were stabled. And so most of the, you know, the workers at the track lived in this neighborhood. So the groomers, the hot trotters, um, the trainers, uh, et cetera. And the racetrack was our, you know, was, was, was a huge part of our economy. Um, you know, our fiscal year started May 1st uh, when the Kentucky Derby ran and, um, you know, ended in November. So it was a thing, you know, we would have yearly customers every year that would call ahead at the beginning of the year to reserve their spot in our yard to, to park. Um, we had pranks we played on the rich people that went to the racetrack coming back out, you know, shit face drunk. We had, um, one of the things we used to do was put uh, money at the end of a, 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 put money on a fishing hook and throw it out into the street and you know, watch them sort of chase it down the, the street, just reeling it in from the top of a garage or something. Um, so, you know, we it was a whole world experience, economy, you know. Um, when I was 10, I sold enough lemonade to buy a, a Yamaha keyboard. So, um, you, you know, it was a big deal, but the, the point is it's never, it has never before been captured in the media. It's never, and Glenna can speak to this, Glenna actually, lived on the other side of the racetrack, uh, sort of the premier side of the racetrack. But, um, you know, the pageantry was, was the only part that was captured in, um, in the news and, and so forth. So I really just wanted to capture this other side of, of Derby um, in that neighborhood. I grew up on the back side of the track, but also when I moved to Black Louisville to the West End, um, with my father, there were, there were particular traditions on that side of town for the Derby too. So uh, this is the title poem, Horsepower. 
Off season, before the racetrack opens, I jump through the threshold of my back door stable side. A dove takes off from its nest tucked into the corner of the porch awning glides through my world, which I can see in its entirety from my top step. The twin steeples and emerald roofs just past our garage. A horse practicing a start out of the gate. Only Longfield, that avenue rounding the perimeter of the pill-shaped track, where the red and white and green flags ripple from balconies in my neighbor's cell horchata and styrofoam cup street tacos and paper baskets with cilantro and lime. Only Longfield and a chain link fence separates the horse's air from mine. They work the loop of that circular mile, making everyone's living except their own, the motors of our economy. Beyond the spires is a larger world I do not know exists. A mile west in my line of vision is a family I do not know I have. In that corner of the city, separating from the land like a cell in mitosis, straining across the Ohio River to the north, my great aunt, black matriarch rocks on her blue porch, and my father, my father, just a couple of blocks away from her, coos my baby brother into sleep while his new wife flowers the wings of a flightless bird. But all I know for now is my grandfather, the white one. And I know my mother who I can hear now roaring home from work in her muscle car. And wait, I know the horses, the horses and their restless minds. And some other things I was thinking about with horsepower too was like, uh, you know, that working class sort of um, measurement that accompanies like industry. Um, and this, you know, like a measurement of speed for trains and, 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 and old school muscle cars and, and so forth. So I feel like it's not just the, the racetrack, but those things that also, um, punctuate like the poem but, but occurred throughout the book and um and also this sort of mental fortitude that, that that restlessness of the mind that wanting to to see more to have more to to get out um in in the mind of the speaker as well um when i was when i knew that i was kind of writing a book about horses or like horses was the main like image system in the book i thought i should probably read shit about horses like the iliad and um you know like pegasus greek mythology and stuff because i was like this hood rat from kentucky and i was like this you know my book's not going to be legitimate if i don't know these references so i gotta like learn all this stuff and um uh i i ended up really digging the iliad um and i really loved the idea of that achilles horses were immortal and the gods kind of showed um, it, um, sympathy, has sympathy for them, but not for the human beings. <laughs> they were like, who did this to these horses? Like, you know, um, so that, that kind of informed this, this poem, Elegy for Kentucky. Nowhere to drive night upon night that last summer, but back, back to the cokey couple I was crashing with in their 26th year habit. On the way there, the same horse always dying at the curve before I turned like a kitschy disco ball onto their street name I can't recall. There she lay toppled like a toy figurine calm but huffing, a laboring machine making steam though the cold air belonged to June, its grief, a filly done before becoming a mother great belly black and wide as all surrender and that magnificent face still against the grass waiting on the end there she was every time whispering something to me a line throbbing a visible heartbeat i watched in the mirror for hours with my huge horse eyes i needed to see her to make sure she was still there I went the same way each evening, wanting to feel something to see this once immortal creature get up any weak thing, was welcome to finish me then. And when he came into the room with bridle and bit on his 26 year high, when he came up on me where I was lying at that curve in my mind, arms and teeth numb, I did not resist. 
just a muted yell inside for months before it lit on me like an ancestor. As a child, I followed my grandfather across the street behind our house, Longfield Avenue, backside of the track where the thoroughbreds for that maze derby were trapped, bored of what they were bred for, all their royalty within a corral. My hand, a child's offering, was empty when they snorted and drew their worn noses across my palm, yet it was in their nature to remain friendly toward me. My home did not keep its promise after my grandfather died. There was no protection for what I was without him. Lone black filly finished before becoming. She must have tired of standing there high headed waiting for me to ride her out of that war to call out, let's go. We are done here. One very cool thing about uh, my birth year, 1988, there's a lot of cool things about that year. There's a lot of also awful things about 1988, but um, a Philly won the Kentucky Derby the year I was born. And as I was like researching the Derby for the book, because again, I, I never, I've never been inside of the racetrack on Derby, um, except for, I, I, just, I just remembered this when I was talking to a reporter at my hometown paper like a week ago, but um, I actually only have ever been inside the racetrack on Derby one time. And that was as um, my basketball team in high school, we did this fundraiser and it was an all black, for context, it's an all black high school, uh, all black basket, girls basketball team. And one fundraiser that was offered to us was that we could wait on, um, we could wait on the, uh, people in the box seats. So these are like the, the so to give you an idea of some of the names of these, um, like, you know, the sort of boxes up at the top it was like Millionaire's Row. I don't know if there's any more, but you know, the, 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 the sort of social dynamic there. So I didn't really know that much about, you know, the history and, you know, that much about the Derby except for like, I could maybe pick a sure horse, you know, but um, I learned that, yeah, a Philly won the, the Derby the year I was born. Um, only, and as you'll hear in the poem, only two Phillies had won before that. Um, and so figure, finding that out at some point, even though this poem comes after Elegy for Kentucky, it, the horse in the book specifically became a Philly. And that sort of opened up this this opportunity to um, for for the for the speaker to sometimes be the horse and the horse sometimes be the speaker. I don't really know how like a a big word for that. I feel like there's probably one, but um, <laughs> so um, what else do I want to say about that? Now after that, no Phillies have won the Kentucky Derby because they're not allowed to run in the big race anymore. They have their own race on Oaks Day the day before. So like you know, I guess there's like horse misogyny too. Um, winning Colors, 1988. Oh yeah, I also noticed I was attempting anapestic, one, two, three. I was, I was attempting like anapestic pentameter here, but eventually it, it drops off. So I don't know if y'all can hear that. Um, winning Colors, 1988. I am born in the season of color blocking and crack in the dawn of the Reagan era the light and dark shades of school days dance across movie screens. A girl horse wins the garland of roses. 554 blooms sprout red around her roan neck, shock of black mane, haze of white down her nose. Before her, only two fillies clutch the purse. Regret in 1915, genuine, genuine risk in 1980 are names for girls. When my birth horse sets off out of the gate, a man and woman are working their 11th hour, twirling around the country club in the graceful choreography of weathered servers. The woman, just 12 weeks pregnant, not yet swollen with her dark choice, the man taking bets and slurs alike out of the mouths of the club's members, rich and red-faced from mint juleps. When the woman hands off her dirty glassware to the man, father of her child, she giggles, smacks him on his great black ass. When the girl comes down the last stretch, she's been out in front the whole race, full of Cairo, violencing the dirt, 
expectations stamped into bets at one point her odds 100 to one. When her net clears the wire into the known world, the dark trumpet sounds. Um, so it's not just sort of the horse also that occurs throughout the book, it's the equus entire, which is another word I discovered in my horse research, which is like, you know, the horse, the donkey and the mule. This is really important when I start to get into sort of like some of the more like black historical poetry as I'm going, as I'm like, I was also an archival um, at the African Cemetery in Lexington, Kentucky while I was uh, living there. And I started to research my own family and found out, you know, um, my people came into Alabama um, in Mobile and then they were sharecroppers for a little bit in, in uh, Appalachia in Alabama. And um, so I was like, the donkey and the mule is very important here. So I sort of opened it up to the, um, the equus and tired. And this is a conversation I had with my grandmother one day and I was like, and I, and I sort of dictated it and I was just like, this is just a poem. So I'm just gonna throw this in here. Quilt and frames. Quilt and frames was what they called Charlie's mule because its bones were like a rack its skin hung over. The mule had more sense than he did taking his drunk ass home every day, my grandmother says on the phone from Cleveland, a long way from Alabama now. She says, when they'd been sewing for a while and the quilt had grown heavy as an animal's coat, they would throw it over a wooden frame to keep it upright. Says she and the other women would sit on the porch same time every evening to see Charlie ride by on his way in from town, Lansville, where he'd go like all the other men after 13 hours in the field. He'd be stone drunk and thrown over the back of that damn mule, she says which knew its way home and how to hold up a worked thing. Um, maybe I'll read one more horse poem. Yeah. One more horse, maybe two. Damn, there's like four more and I wanted to read some of the essay. What y'all think, more horse poems or do you wanna hear some of the essay? Let me show you what y'all saying. Okay, we'll try, we'll try. Um, okay, I'll try. Uh, my father teaches me how to slip away with Clarence Carter on in the background. And there I sit in my mother's white Plymouth stolen in the open under advisement of this country's laws and customs. I wait beneath. The Hollywood videos, fanatic purple lights, their appliance buzz sound of the spectral past crackling in and out, I wait for my mother to return to go back to the only home I've ever known but inside. She's been stunned still at the sight of my father, possibly a mirage I must have been, asking for him, begging. But she had no address, no number to call. This moment, pure chance, a warp, and the spinning wax come back around her mind skipping as she stands before him with West Side Story in hand, and then speaks finally to tell him I am out in the car. And that night my father will tell his wife I exist. And that night he'll make it to my grandfather's house with this declaration on his lips. He'll try even again after being turned away for seven years by a many chambered gun. And this time when he arrives somehow, my mother knows he is there waiting in the outer space air of October. This time a window is open and ash is falling from his cigarette behind the barbecue pit where he crouches just as the nightmare curls back from my skin like smoke. This time my grandfather is unaware, bound to his makeshift couch bed by malignancy when my mother pulls me through the cone of light cast from his living room and toward my black life. When we still pass the safe that holds the revolver wrapped in a tea towel, my free fist turns like a wrench in my eye. And then the heavy oak door whispered open by the sparkle of my father's knuckles. And then my mother pushing me onto the night porch saying, your father, this is your father. Before me, Amira, my horse mind flickers. When I step into him and look back at my mother, she is on the other side. Um, the poem right after that in the book is um, is uh, called Absidarian for Alzheimer's. Y'all know what an Absidarian is? Probably, yes. Okay, good. Everybody's shaking their head. 
Uh, I'm glad because I I'd be confused about how to explain that. I, I'm I'm like A B C D E F G H I J K L M N P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. Um, and uh, uh, what do I want to say about this? Yeah. Um, oh, I was re so I was re in my Greek mythology research. I found out about Veritas, and I was just using that. I was just using the material, y'all. Um, yeah, so Absidarian for Alzheimer's. Angel was my papa's girlfriend when he died. Back there in my memory, I hear my mother fussing about condoms and age, she is saying, the girl is only 25 and black. My daddy amused at the irony of racism, whispering to me, he's at his end anyway. Angel was stripping at deja vu when he moved her into the front bedroom. And this is where I began to realize what precisely was going on. He couldn't remember me, but by then he was forgetting who he was too. Outside the club next to our world famous horse racing track, the infamous sign read, win place show bar, 99 pretty girls and one ugly one, a jab at Angel, their only dark skinned dancer. She mystified them with her kaleidoscope of color contacts and quick weaves. They loved her equine legs. I loved her for telling my secret loud, for make, making a messy joke of him and my mother the way I felt they had made a mess of me. After Angel moved in, I never saw him again. My mother avoided his street. She could not get over the hypocrisy, how he disowned her when I was born, then made her promise not to speak of my blackness, my father to me, buried hole of quiet lies they dug for years before it opened beneath the two of us and ruined everything. Maybe my mother envied Angel because she saw the truth of him out. And when he began forgetting to hate us, to put his white hood on every day, Angel used him the proper way. I like to think of her as Veritas, the goddess at the bottom of that empty well, naked and holding a hand mirror. Or maybe it was me, a Syriac unblooming thing down there beneath them I had for years been taught to live that way. Black, unassuming, zipped up in history, a disease not even progress can cure. I be meaning that shit. When I read that, I be meaning that shit. Um, okay, one one more horse poem. Uh, okay, one more equus poem because it's the mule. It's the mule coming back in from Alabama. The mule from Alabama, y'all. We all know the mule's name. The mule had a name, but now the mule loses its name in this poem. Um, my father teaches me how to handle. The my father teaches me is like a series throughout the book. Um, uh, where, you know, it's like my father teaches me something. Um, a yeah, a disease not even progress can cure. I like that line means something different now, you know? And I, and I think about it a lot. Sometimes I just go look at the line. Uh, but I was kind of thinking politically, I was thinking like, you know, I was kind of, um, I, I have issues with the, with this word progress progressives or progress, we need to make progress. We've made a lot of progress since 1960, whatever. Um, and how like progress is usually only good for white people, you know, um, or like progress for them often means like some sort of destruction in um, black and brown communities. Um, but now it's like not even progress can destroy our historical issues, this disease progressing among us right now. You know, it, it even that exacerbates the issues, you know. My f Here's the mule again, y'all from Alabama. My father teaches me how to handle a pistol. Twin Rugers, he got like way more guns though, but the Rugers are kind of his, his little special guns. And he got two of them. Twin Rugers resting side by side on the emerald felt for the good times playing low through evening's kitchen as he takes them apart and puts them back together. How can I know what he's remembering as he shoves one grip first into my hesitant hand and swallows the last of the mild beck, his stained lips cracking into a rare authentic smile. He cannot imagine the first gun I held belonged to a boy who loved me too much when he pointed it my way. Cannot know I'm still holding its lead back with the force of my eyes. Where my father says his grandmother Elsie lives now to terrorize him. I think about her 
working those molten fields, how tough she must have been living alone with two of the meanest men in our family of mean men. When I learn how tough it is to pull back on the slide, I think of her, pretty yellow Negro, the men say, so poor her mule had no name its ribs visible across the field where she stood watching her father-in-law Spence beat blood and foam from it. When I learn to lock the lever and look down the chamber, I think of her oiled pistol exhausted at her dirt stained thigh, hand on her hip insouciant and tired, just tired. Don't ever put your finger on the trigger unless you're ready to pull it, my father says. So I keep it straight, learn what she was tested by to get eyes old enough to hold a bullet still. Okay, what well, we got, 637. Okay, um, I think I was supposed to only read for 40 minutes, which means I was supposed to be done at 640. So y'all could then ask me questions. Is that true? So that means I could probably read one more poem and not the essay at all. That's okay. I was the only one that wanted to read the essay. Uh, hey, Joy, you can read the essay. Um, we'd love to hear it if that's what you feel like reading. Okay. And, um, just, you, can, you can read as long as you want. I'm happy to, you know, there's no, yeah, read the essay. <laughs> I forgot I wrote this thing. And then guess what, y'all? It got nominated for a push card. And it's my first push card nomination, which, I, you know what I'm saying? I think it's kind of late. Like, yeah. Um, and then I was hyped because like they, they write you and they're like, can you send us your address so we can send you a letter because you've been nominated for a push card. So I was like, oh, which poem? Finally, my poems have been recognized by the push card committee. And it was like, nah, it's for this essay, homie. <laughs> like, I was like, okay, fine. No push card, no best American poetry. <sighs> I'm coming for you. I feel most Southern in the hip hop of my adolescence. Ooh, could I possibly share my screen so y'all can see the uh, photos? So I have this uh, friend in, in Louisville named Landon and he's sort of like my, kind of be photographing stuff for me. But anyways, he already had, he, he photographs for the racetrack. So he usually photographs horses, but in the, on the side, he photographs all the old schools that he comes across. Um, so it's kind of like, it's cool because it's like the whole, horse and then horsepower theme we you know what i'm saying we like kind of there so um let's see boom so beautiful this is actually in houston at screwed up records and tapes which is where i live now uh but he's the kentucky photographer okay i feel most southern in the hip-hop of my adolescence on Black Southern mobility, interregionality, and internalized misogyny. My Southerness was seeded by the matriarchs on my father's side, Black women who came up from Alabama sharecropping fields in the 20th century to do day work, the language, a euphemism for taking care of white families, a pentimento of the plantation schedule. In my own lifetime, I found an affirmation of my Southern identity in the music of my adolescence where I spent a lot of time in cars. In the odds, Kentucky didn't have a definitive sound on mainstream radio, but Black Kentuckians heard our experiences in Southern hip hop no matter which state it came out of, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, Virginia. We didn't feel Southern because we were listening to Southern rap. We felt Southern rap because the tempo matched the cadence of our lives and kept the record of the peripheral cultures that shaped our language and movements. So 1999, I'm gonna skip this part because we already know what's up, back that ass up, you know, Seminole Southern Anthem. Um, let's go to 2000, 2000. Um, so I have these kind of like track listings, as you can see. The, I just tried to think of like the major albums and songs from each year. Um, I got Stankonia by Outkast, Danger, a song by Mystical, produced by the Neptunes. And the places these folks come out of are Atlanta, New Orleans, Virginia Beach. In Old Louisville though, a well-preserved historic district downtown, populated exclusively by Victorian houses, 9th Street branches off from 7th Street, 
like an empty aqueduct. From there, it begins its journey northwest toward the West End. Somebody said the West End, the best end. By the time 9th Street makes it to Broadway, the city's major downtown thoroughfare, it has become a border with enough narrative resonance in our city to have earned a nickname, the Berlin Wall. Called such because it separates the West End economically, politically, visually, and psychically, the 9th Street divide is a common phrase uttered to tourists by downtown bartenders as a boundary not to venture beyond. Historically, it served as a divide between urban renewal projects and the business district. Currently, it corrals Black civilians within 30 or so blocks, effectively cut off from the rest of the city. It's sit-down restaurants and hospitals, movie theaters, and grocery stores. 30% of Western residents do not own a vehicle, but the bus route will eventually get you to work on the other side of town. And on foot, you can get to church or the liquor store, depending on what kind of spirit you are trying to catch fire in your belly or fire on your head. In the first year of the new century, your slightly older teenage uncle has a 1983 Z28 Camaro T-top. It's a bucket, but you want the same car when you get older. There's a detaching face CD player and some rattle in the trunk, but the power windows won't come down and it's burning up in the early morning heat wave. At every pothole or railroad track, the radio cuts out. There's a short in the wiring, but his guy says it's not worth the cost to fix it. So he resorts to the usual banging on the dashboard until it cuts back in. This is not a 1983 Z28 Camaro T-top, it's a bro ham. But this is in the West End. This was a taken in, I think this is 16th Street. These are a bunch of like dilapidated factories. Um, I just think it's interesting too in Kentucky, you kind of get this old school culture, but like it snows. So like you people like put their cars up for the winter to preserve them and like bring them back out, you know, in the warmer weather. But sometimes you'll, you'll I think this is what appealed to him about this photograph was the snow on it. 2001, Raised Up by Petey Pablo, Timberland. 2002, Watermelon Chicken and Grits by Who, Nappy Roots. Um, Chopper Style by Chopper Greenville, Norfolk, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and New Orleans. At the end of every week, is there another picture? No. At the end of every week, we started in early with pleas to convince our parents to let us go to Saturday Skate at Champs Roller Rink located on the ominously curvy man slick road where the working class white and black sides of town converged. It was each time a difficult convincing considering the night always ended prematurely with a fist fight or a skate, skate opening someone's scalp. But somehow we managed to arrive under the glow in the dark purple lights with money in hand for speed skates and surge soda. There was always a favorite cut that got everyone to the floor when the rink reached capacity and speed skates became pointless inside the slow turning mass. P.D. Pablo was talking about a place none of us had thought about before, but when Rep. Yo City rain, refrained from the rink speakers in that gravel crunch voice that held the church and the liquor store we raised up. Maybe North Carolina hated the song. Maybe the big city black folks in Charlotte were embarrassed by that country shit the way the big city black folks in Louisville were embarrassed by the first mainstream Kentucky rap group that would debut the next year with watermelon, chicken and grits, a corny misrepresentation too public to defend. When they sang about their newfound contentment with lifelong poverty even in an overpronounced twang, we weren't trying to hear that shit. Being poor definitely still mattered to us and the struggle wasn't something we were in a place to look back on as teenagers and celebrate. Still, these songs of representation at the beginning of the millennium portended a come up for those of us living in American obscurity. As we transitioned into the crunk era, repping your city became repping your set. Our spaces shrunk and our divides multiplied beyond North South or poor black, poor white. The black got hotter and our square radius became even more constricted. In the meantime, back at the rink, we kissed our teeth at the boys and skated onto the floor to the ow wow and wop wop drums that signaled the start of chopper style. In that moment, wasn't none of us trying to parse our circumstances with intellect. We were trying to feel it, trying to turn so many revolutions around that rink that we couldn't feel the heat anymore for the wind. 
We knew what difference a breeze made inside a cage, how much mobility mattered inside a loop you couldn't figure out how to exit. Two thousand four, crime mob, the Carter, Little Wayne, urban legend, Ti, straight out of Cashville, Young Buck, Atlantic, Nashville, New Orleans. Some of us left in the furnaces of steamboats. Some left as porters on the train. Some stayed. Some migrated north, but not far enough. If you landed in Kentucky, say from Alabama, you might have thought of it as the north before you got there, but realized it was still Dixie once you arrived. Everywhere in America, Dixie. Everywhere a running history of bondage beneath the surface of society peeking out. In the 19th century, rather than a plantation structure, the Louisville economy was organized around a bondsman system, an ironic mobility for black folks who were rented out to various proprietors around the city for task-based jobs rather than confined to an estate, physically speaking. In the mid 20th century, this class structure remained in place, but mobility became increasingly more restricted after 24 seven electric streetcar service ended in 1948. As black folks bought homes, white flight commenced in the West End and the Ninth Street divide became a defining reality. To have your own car meant everything. It was a symbol of mobility and success in a Southern city that did not have a mass public transportation system or an Amtrak rail to ride out of state, just a fraught inner city bus line to get you downtown to your restaurant job or assembly line. Fast forward to the arts and car culture was a thriving black Southern art genre, a canvas for one's personality and style. This was one of the peripheral cultures that Southern rap preserved for us alongside our dance anthems and idioms, gold grill fronts, lunch table beats, and internalized massage noir. The fall of her sophomore year, a girl drives her 1988 Cutlass Supreme Classic to school with just a permit, a perfectly acceptable thing to do as a 15 year old in Kentucky. Her father's coworker at High Tech Cutting Services has sold it to her for a charitable $500. When she drives up to Central High Magnet Career Academy, a fancy name that belies the poor state of Muhammad Ali's historically black alma mater, she has the respect of men. They begin to invite her on exclusive dips to practice formations for cruising at the park or on Derby. In the era of crime mob and even the dudes rap princesses and diamonds verses, it is acceptable to have a girl in your crew. And as a girl, if you have something that interests boys besides your body, it saves you a lot of trouble. The body of her car is in mint condition, ox blood drip 307 V8. At post 9-11 gas prices, her entire sonic drive-in paycheck starts going to gas. It doesn't matter as long as she can take herself wherever she wants to go and leave whenever she wants to leave. As long as she isn't the girl young buck raps about and shorty want to ride trapped in some dude's fantasy, just another commodity or feature of his car. I'll stop there. Uh, in case y'all want to shit chat. Um, a little bit. Thank y'all so much for listening. Thanks, Joy. Um, I wanted to invite everyone to unmute and give you a round of applause or hoot and holler or whoever you want to make an exclamatory noise. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> um, and um, Joy is happy to take uh, questions um, either in the gallery mode or in the chat, um, whichever one you want to prefer. But to open it up, I was wondering if you could talk about um, the project you just announced um, with Saraband Press on the uh, Louisville uh, anthology that you're, you'll, you've been um, commissioned to edit. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually... Uh... How did that start? Oh, I taught a workshop for them last summer as my city was in like major unrest over Breonna Taylor's uh, murder. And um, the their, they, their, their workshops are traditionally for uh, female, um, sorry, uh, women, femme, and uh, 
trans women, uh, you know, like, like they leave out, um, they, you know, they're not open, they're, they're for that particular group. So like a lot of, like everybody was kind of like trying to get into the workshop because they had something to say. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just do another workshop for everybody next time. But what ha ended up happening is I was talking to Kristen Miller, who's a poet and um, she's uh, like the managing editor for Sarah Band. And I was like, you know, it, cause, cause everybody kept hitting me up. Like we should do our own anthology. You know, we got, you know, we got, we got things to say. And then like the slams aren't happening in the city right now because of COVID. So I hit her up and was like, let me do an anthology because I have like, I, I was sitting at all of these, this intersection of like the West End um, poets, um, my cousins in the 90s, 80s and 90s and uh, 2000s had a, a poet, a coffee shop in the West End um, that I started reading poems in as a little girl. So just over the years, I have just know all these different um, groups of poets, but also I know the MFA, uh, I, I taught at Spalding's MFA program in Louisville. I know the U of L poets. I know the, you know, like the Afro-Latin poets. I'm a member of the Afro-Latin poets. So it's like, I have all, I'm like, you know, sort of felt like I was at the intersection of all these communities and could sort of curate, um, you know, an anthology. And also I just think, um, it, you know, something, it, 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 the moment sort of requires it. Uh, because, because again, I mean, living in a place like Louisville, like, you know, it's like the, it's like the fourth most segregated city in the country after Detroit, Milwaukee, and Cleveland, but no one talks about it because it's not a place that's in like the popular imagination. And, you know, we talk about horses, bourbon, and basketball, but no one talks about the huge literary legacy in Kentucky. And I, and I know just like being from Louisville, how many writers there are in just that city and how many writers really are just like begging for um, a venue to talk about the obscurity that they lived in, not just like obscurity as living in Kentucky, but in Louisville as a, in the West End. Like there are so many people I've spoken to that are from Louisville who've just never been to the West End. It's that isolated socially from the rest of the city. And so, um, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to uh, to to do this anthology, which I'm gonna I'm gonna be prioritizing those underrepresented communities first. Thanks for sharing that. It sounds like you're the perfect person to be able to curate that anthology, and I'm I'm really excited for us to have that um, as a resource to access um, those writers. Um, I have a question from the chat. Can you go back to what you said about love and hunt having the same root work, uh, root word? How did you discover that connection? Uh, yeah, so I was just reading that book. Um, it's it's an excerpt. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, it's a reference book that's like just uh, it's just full of like group nouns like. Uh, a murder of crows, which by the way, I always, I, now I want to write a poem about everything because I'm like, why the black bird got to be murderous, you know, and like, where do these things come from? <laughs> like, but uh, it's called an exaltation of larks by James Lipton. It's the dude that did like uh, actor's theater. He used to host actor, actor's theater, but apparently he was like also a writer and he was just into this kind of stuff. And so he was just really looking into like group nouns, just trying to collect them, I guess. And like, he ended up discovering that in the medieval times, I guess, cause they was bored and shit. They just made like, their entertainment was around like this hunting game they made up. And there was also like a part about like memorizing these collective group nouns. And it was just kind of like a pastime, I guess. Um, but as I was reading through the book, my neighbor is so loud. She'd be like, oh, ow! on the phone outside like, damn please but then when I go outside she don't speak to me so but anyways um so in I don't know how I found out but like venery it was like uh I think it was like games of venery and uh I, I thought oh well what about I think I, I think from there I thought about the word veneration as like love you know love and um what else? Yeah. And so I just started looking into it from there and maybe the book mentioned something about it, but I just know that um, love, veneration and venery 
hunting are from the same root word. Um, can y'all hear her? <laughs> Girl, be quiet. Um, no, I'm just kidding. We gotta, we gotta live, live with our neighbor's loudnesses, you know? That's anti-colonial. Okay, so um, so yeah, I think that's all I got on on the that root word. But it's real. I I, I looked. At, I found a lot of stuff on it. It's just like I finished that book in two thousand eighteen, so I can't. I kind of can't remember some stuff sometimes. You know, actually, I'm a poet because I'm my memory's bad, and I'm always trying to archive stuff. So <laughs> that makes sense to me because I. Um, it seems like a lot of your poems access or go back into memory. And I was wondering about mm -hmm. your relationship to memory um, as a way to craft poems. Um, yeah, I actually, I actually craft poems from a noun chart that I make that's like people, places, and things. And I feel the chart just ongoing. I've been doing it for like probably a decade with like those things that continue to recur to me like the memories that haunt you, like it's not something you remember like one time, but you remember like regularly. Like there's this dream I had when I was five years old that I still remember of like, it was like a nightmare of me and my mom being like uh, confined to like strapped down to a bed and like monsters running around us. I still remember that like frequently. And so like, I'll put like, like under thing, I'll be like the monster dream, you know? And so I just like keep a running list of, uh, of stuff like that. Or it could just be like something your grandfather said when you was a kid or a particular car one of your parents drove or something. I, I just like, whenever I realize that that's a memory that keeps popping up, I'll write it into that chart. And I work from like, if I don't, if I feel like I don't have anything to write about, I'll go to the chart, so. A lot of poems come out of that. Uh, yeah, someone just commented that that's a great tip and it is. Thanks for sharing that part of your process. Um, does anyone else have questions? Um, I was wondering, Joy, if you could talk about um, the classification or the moniker um, Afro, 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 Afrolation. Um, I'm sorry, I'm saying that incorrectly. Um, and I was wondering if you could describe what that means to you. And um, yeah, because I don't want to make any assumptions. Um, yeah, so Afrolatcha is a word that was coined by Frank X. Walker in like 1991. And um, um, he's a Kentucky poet, a Kentucky poet laureate. Um, in 1990 90 or 1991, the University of Kentucky hired Nikki Finney. Um, and when she got there, uh, like part of her arrival, I guess, culminated with this panel they invited her to be on um, for, um, now my dog is like drinking water all out, uh, <laughs> from like, uh, <laughs> from uh, to, like a, this panel about Afrolatcha and like the chair of the Southern Studies Department was like, oh, well now we gotta change the title. The implication being because she was black and there aren't, and, and Afrolatcha doesn't encompass black people. And there's this kind of like this, uh, I think this thought, the stereotype that um, Afrolatcha is a, I mean, Appalachia is a homogeneous region with just like white folks. Um, but actually there's like um, a history of like Puerto Ricans and Afrolatcha, I mean, Appalachia, I just say Afrolatcha now, <laughs> Appalachia, um, black, uh, you know, just like the coal industry by a lot of folks, black folks. Um, yeah, so uh, the idea, so then they, so Nikki was a professor and all the founding members were like her students and they would just like meet as a writing group every week on the side. And I imagine like the nineties in Kentucky was not very friendly. When I went to UK in 2007, it was a 1% black student population and it was very like segregated. So, um, so I imagine like this was kind of like a response to just trying to make a space for themselves. And so they called themselves after that like they, after Frank had coined this term Afrolatcha, they called themselves Afrolatchian poets. And um, the, the the mission or the, the idea is just to kind of like, you know, 
keep uh, people of color visible in the region. And, um, and so I became a member in 2013, along with Gerard Avant and um, Danny Quintos and um, Dorian Hairston. And there's like 50 plus members now. Um, you have to have some sort of connection to, to Appalachia. I didn't grow up in Appalachia, I grew up in Louisville, but my grandparents, the ones that down in Alabama with the nameless mule, uh, were sharecroppers in Moton, Alabama, which is in Appalachia. So that was like my connection that I uh, applied with. And yeah, so. Thanks for explaining that. I also um, was was interested in how uh, that that name connects people to place and inhabiting land and a uh, landscape. Um, and I was interested in, um, yeah, your your connection to place and Kentucky and Louisville and in crafting that land crafting landscape in your work. Um, sorry, that's not a question. <laughs> people people ask me about place like every reading. So I've yeah. well, I've thought a lot about it now. <laughs> like, I just like I'm like well, I don't know what to say. It sounds more like an observation, which is what yeah. I think is. yeah. But um but I, one thing I did notice about place uh in thinking about place after, you know, from being asked about it in readings in the collection is that um you know, place is sort of uh, it, it cannot be divorced. Place in the, the setting and place in the book cannot be divorced from the the sort of nonlinear narrative in the book. And um, that's because the speaker uh, is going from South Louisville to West Louisville from one parent to the other. And that's, uh, so you can't, and so the geography of the city is, uh, is like crucial to the narrative. And um, uh, uh, someone actually did a literary map of my book, which was really cool. But, um, and apparently it's something that like, oh, look at old Jeremiah. He's late, I'm gonna admit him, is that okay? Um, yeah, so like someone, someone, did a, someone did a literary map, which is like this thing that this scholar invented in Detroit where like you, you map the, you, you find the city map and you map the, the, the places in the city on on the map, like from the book, the poems. That was like, I was so honored by that. That was so cool. That's like on the bind, the bind.net. Um, the bind reviews, the bind reviews. So. Um, that sounds so cool, Joy. I, I really want to see that now. Yeah, um, but uh, but places like, I use place, like I, I like, I like, the, the features of, I recently did this workshop called The Autobiography of the Landscape. I was really inspired by Ocean Vuong's essay on Instagram, uh, which talked about the DNA of seeing or the autobiography of sight. And I was like, ooh, ooh, I'm always talking about that, but you named it, I'm jealous, you know. Uh, but, you know, the idea of like, um, the way, the, the figure of language that you use because of where you're from, like the landscape you come from. Like, I'm in Texas right now. If I go outside, it's like hella banana trees and lime trees. But where I'm from, it's like oak trees and not that there's not oak trees here, but it's just a different kind of flora and fauna. You know, there's little lizards running around here. And um, so uh, I think those things inform like our image systems. And so the image system of my book, you know, I use, the images I use, I leaned heavily on like place, like the place I grew up in. I'm trying to think of like, who doesn't write about place? Like who does, like, is that a thing? Like. I don't know. I, I guess I would like. When, so I'm gonna start asking people. What? Give me an example of a book that place doesn't images of place don't make it into. Because not that the, I don't think that they don't exist. I just like want to know the different. Like I need to see the distinction. Um, there is a tagline. Uh -huh. Do you want to ask? Do you want to say that question, Sarah? I'm I'm like taking over. No, no, sure. Yeah, it's um, there is a tagline on your book about escape narrative and the other arc that comes to mind and is the hero's journey. But your collection seems like counter narrative to both those arcs. Can you talk a little bit about how your book works 
as potentially a counter narrative or narrative or both counter and narrative, countering narrative. I, I was I was with you on the first part of that question. But can you can you explain what you mean by like counter narrative if you feel like talking? Yeah, Angel, do you want to um, either say more in the chat or feel free to unmute um, and uh, ask your question directly? Teach, teach. Yeah, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for the reading, Joy. I, you know, I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, hear the poems. Um, yeah, I think you know the the escape narrative. There's so much that's inescapable, right? Particularly for people of color in terms of poverty, in terms of escaping, you know, racism, misogyny, whatever it might be, and you know, the hero's journey. You know, that's that's a bit of privilege to be able to kind of get up and go, right? And so, um, you know, and, and I and I love that your father becomes the wise man, and or or the the wise man in, in these series, right? Like he's the one kind of instilling this knowledge um, for for um, the speaker. So, you, you know, I, I don't know that you're thinking about counter narrative, but maybe the ways in which it, which your collection um, gives us an alternative and, and maybe what that alternative might be for you as the poet. I'm so glad I asked you to start, speak more about it, because like I didn't even think about the wise man. Like that's the first time I've thought about that sort of like archetype. And um, and it really does. It really kind of does talk explain the impulse. But the for me making the father like such a figure in the book of like wisdom, a source of wisdom. Um, and that's 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 like also intentional because counter narrative makes me think of John Keaton's work. But um uh if you if y'all haven't if y'all don't know about counter narratives by John Keaton, like that book is there's no other book like that book. It's so dope. Um but uh <sighs> You know, I was thinking, so I really like that Gregory Pardlow compared uh, this book to Zora Neale Hurston and Jean Toomer because uh, I actually asked, I actually had asked Jessamyn Ward to blurb it too. And like, um, she agreed, but it's, then she went through some tragedies and like wasn't able to do it. But I wanted, I just kind of wanted that crossover because I felt like I was writing like a like sort of cinematically a narrative like a non-linear narrative where you come in in media res and you sort of like jump back and forth through these scenes and it was more it, and I knew I was writing narrative poetry and people would say that like over the 10 years I was writing the book and sometimes it felt insulting and I was like I'm gonna lean into it and so there are a lot of fiction conventions I think and one the major one I thought about was I'm gonna write a building's Roman. You know, so it is like a coming of age narrative. Now, the difference is, or sort of the alternative, uh, as you were talking about is, is like the black child doesn't have the benefit of the luxury of like naivete. That's sort of the, the you know, the, the white boy protagonist has in the traditional buildings from mine. Uh, that's my reading, you know, and so, I wrote this, this tagline actually comes from this longer book description that I wrote for the, the authors, the AQ. And um, in there, I said something like, you know, uh, you know, she doesn't have the luxury of, of uh, naivete, but from the beginning must, um, must uh, adopt the, you know the mentality of the horses and their restless minds, and and their their sort of uh, hyper vigilance, and uh, and so um, I think that's like I was thinking of the buildings Roman, but I was thinking of like how to disrupt that sort of uh, genre, and um, yeah. Um, and, and, and yes, you're right. Like, obviously there's, obviously, you know, the bookshelves, you can't escape these things. Like it's an attempt at a physical escape. And one of the, the main escapes is like uh, being, like I was reading a lot of fugit like scholars of fugitivity and um, thinking about like literally how that's not like just a theory, that's a literal thing. Like that was, that's the Fugitive Slave Act is in the constitution of the United States, which, which still exists. Um, and, and the idea that like black black folks in this country are inherently fugitive uh, from its laws and cust like under its laws and customs, 
uh, and, uh, you know, brown people too as well. And so um, I was thinking of like, one of the main escapes I was thinking of was, was the black child from her white parents, how, her white mother's household. Like in this household where she was literally not allowed to be black, like uh, this sort of mental escape from that, um, this escape from one, from that household to another and getting this, this black wisdom from the father figure in the book, finally. So even though it's not like, yeah, all the things that you get in the third section, the violence, the poverty, the loss of loved ones, and the guilt at like physically leaving, um, you know, you don't get like an actual escape from that, but there are these, 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 um, there is an escape. I feel like there is an, a mental escape from white supremacy, a mental escape in the book, which was important. Thanks. I, I never thought that far into it out loud in front of people. So thank you for the opportunity. Any last burning questions that, you know, if you don't ask, right now, uh, you will feel unfulfilled. <laughs> Maybe that's the wrong way to fra frame it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna, um, Kylie, did you have a question? I'm, oh, she's really looking forward to the craft talk, which is a great segue for me saying that I just dropped a link into the chat to Joy's um, personal website. And I'm also gonna drop in a link to signing up for the craft talk, which is tomorrow morning at 10, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and, oh yeah, Joy says that her website's not updated. Um, the bio that we read tonight is the most updated because um, things have happened since, um, and uh, yeah, you're definitely, yeah, you're, <laughs> things are happening for you. Um, I also am gonna um, drop in again, the link to that essay that Joy, um, Joy read tonight. So if you wanted to read that in full, it is available online. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about the craft talk tomorrow. And um, we, uh, do have a few one-on-one -on -one manuscript consultation slots to work with Joy, um, and there is a deadline tomorrow, 1 p.m., um, to sign up for those, and that's also accessible in the sign-up um, link for the craft talk. So, thank you so much, Joy, for reading and sharing um, about your book. And reading the essay felt really like felt like really special to hear you read um, from that. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the, the future anthology that you're working on and whatever project you get to work on next. And congratulations on your NEA um, and all the other things that are happening for you. It's so deserved and we're just lucky to have you um, here for Vermont Studio Center. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you y'all so much, everybody for coming tonight on Friday, even though we don't have anywhere physically to go, it's Friday. So thank y'all so much. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'll I'll hold the room, the Zoom room open if anyone has any questions or wants to talk to me about Vermont Studio Center specifically. Um, but thank you so much, Joy, and I will see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>